With us today as our visiting scholar in practice is Craig Goodmark. Mr. Goodmark's bio is in your materials, but if you'll indulge me, I will read through it. Mr. Goodmark is the director of the Team Child Atlanta Project at Atlanta Legal Aid. Team Child provides legal services to low-income families with outstanding educational issues, children involved in the juvenile justice system, uh, or children whose unmet needs have not been addressed. In this capacity, Mr. Goodmark provides technical assistance, advocacy, and full legal representation to low-income families whose disabled children are not having their developmental, educational, or mental health needs met. Mr. Goodmark has represented hundreds of students in the metropolitan Atlanta area secure appropriate educational services. Prior to entering legal services, Mr. Goodmark spent five years in private practice at law firms specializing in education law with an emphasis on special education litigation. Mr. Goodmark has represented teachers, students, and families of children with disabilities. He currently sits on the Educational Advocacy Advisory Committee with the Fulton County Juvenile Court and the State Bar of Georgia Children and the Courts Committee. Mr. Goodmark is also a member of the National Organization for Special Education Lawyers, the Council of Parent Attorneys and, Advo Council of Parent Attorneys and Advocates. Mr. Goodmark is an honors graduate of the University of Florida College of Law, where he participated in the initial Team Child Clinic in Gainesville, Florida. So if you weren't already familiar with Craig, certainly I hope that bio convinces you that we've found the expert on educational advocacy. I can tell you that I benefit and learn from Craig every time I hear him speak. And so it's with a um, great amount of privilege that I now turn the podium over to Craig. <clears throat> thanks so much, and uh, thanks for having me here. Um, it's always nice to come talk special education law to uh, new faces, uh, to come discuss current problems with the faces that I know, um, but most of all just to get one of those free parking spots down here at Emory Law School, which is so coveted. Um, Today, we're going to do Special Education 101. It's going to be the basics, and if you've already got the basics, um, if you have a question you'd like me to build on, we can do that as we go along. Um, but as I've found in my time here, I, a lot of turnover in, in the stakeholders that deal with kids causes us to have some institutional problems with memory. Um, the caseworkers that we're working with the kid have transitioned out, the teachers, the, um, the probation officers, um, just people in the community that advocate for kids with disabilities, um, they're going to move through. And even though I'm still here and I understand that I've given this talk several times, I get new people in and I get the same questions as uh, we had seven years ago. So I want to take it back to the, uh, the basics and then if we need to build on that with some issues, we can. Uh, today we're going to talk about special education advocacy for court-involved youth and really there's only a few things specific to court-involved youth that make it different than a discussion about special education in general. And so lots of what you'll hear me talk about will apply to kids across the board, kids in delinquency proceedings, kids that are involved in the mental health system, as well as kids that are involved in the child welfare system. Um, special ed, uh, doesn't designate specifically between those systems uh, with a few small exceptions um, and with regard to those exceptions whether or not it works well or is something that we can discuss. Um, we're going to talk generally about special education and the foundations of the law then discuss the process and, and in my mind special education isn't the law but it's the procedure it's the process that you go through uh, as a child with a disability to ensure that public schools are accommodating that disability. We'll talk about some specific issues like discipline, hopefully, uh, and then talk about what happens in the event of a dispute. Uh, and really, for our stakeholders, I think the beginning part of our talk is going to be the most crucial part, uh, because you're going to need to understand these procedures. Um, you'll need to understand why it is the school is saying what they're saying. And lots of times, and this has been my experience working with uh, caseworkers, working with child advocates, working with attorneys that are representing parents and, and kids, it's not, that they, they, they're, they're, it's not that they're asking for the wrong thing. It's that they're asking in the wrong way. And it's not that they are you know, not effective at understanding what the school is saying. They're just not using the same language as the school. And it's, it's sometimes my job to just come in and, and help communicate, to, to decipher the education speak because, you know, as we even get started today, you'll see 
It's riddled with acronyms. It's riddled with very con it's you know industry specific language, um, and lots of times that can that can keep uh, you know two like minded parties from reaching an agreement just simply because they don't understand the language that the other is speaking. Um, so as we get started today, I understand that you guys are stakeholders. I I put this on here, and, and you can imagine a picture of Russell Crowe and Gladiator because it's in your materials, but uh, I had some technical difficulties. Uh, but I want to say that if you are engaging in special education advocacy on any level, you are engaging in one of the most challenging areas of uh, public interest law, of law, um, of, of child welfare. This is one of the hardest things that you can do. You're, you're combining law psychology, pedagogy, uh, educational philosophy, you're putting it all into a mix and then trying to come out with a collaborative uh, process of decision making that's going to be effective for sometimes a, a manifestation of a disability that you have yet to figure out what it is. Uh, and you guys will, I know you'll let me talk some more stories as we go along today. Uh, we have a kid right now who nobody knows why he can't read. Nobody. Not the psychologists, not our experts, not schools experts. And you know, we keep going along making plans, but there is no answer. And we've had kids in the past where nobody understands why he does what he does when he gets into English class or why he does what he does when he gets into math. And we can only, through kind of the continuing collaborative process uh, and the, the investigative process, the evaluative process, uh, try to figure out what's working, eliminate what's not working, and try to make a plan that accommodates the, uh, you know, the disability of the child. So it's hard. And when you're dealing with issues like child welfare issues, when you have uh, displacement, home issues, possibly abuse, um, neglect, make it even harder. When you're dealing with mental health issues that manifest themselves behaviorally, make it even harder. School is hard enough as it is. Learning to read, learning to do math, that's as challenging a task as, as you, can, you, know, you can give a young person. Add in neglect, abuse, mental health issues, and you really, you are challenging uh, that little person uh, to, to make strides. And, it, and it's our job as stakeholders, as people that are engaged in the collaborative process of building IEPs, and we'll talk about that today, um, to understand that. Uh, and, and, you know, I have to give my disclaimer. I'm a lawyer for families and kids, okay? And I know I even see school people in the, in the crowd, and I know people that sit on the other side, and there's people that uh, don't sit on either side and just simply uh, don't engage in this process. Um, but it used to be that I was guns blazing, ready to sue, ready to go out for my client and just, you know, scorched earth and tear it apart. Uh, and, and sometimes that's still what needs to happen. But a lot of what needs to happen is already in the regulations as far as collaboration and decision making and problem solving with regards to kids in education. And if it was just followed the way it was contemplated by the Congress, I think we would see a lot better outcomes, especially in Metro. Um, sometimes that doesn't happen, and sometimes that's why lawyers are needed to inject themselves in the process. That's why advocates exist. Um, but usually, my discussion in the community is that first we collaborate, and then once the collaboration breaks down or becomes ineffective, then we move on uh, to the other options that the statute contemplates. Um, the collaborative process can work. I've seen it work really well. Uh, and then, you know, obviously the legal avenues that are available to families, that, that's, the, uh, that's the alternative that they have if it does break down. But in any event, there's my disclaimer. I represent families. We sue people. It happens, and you know, we'll move on. Um, in any event, if my language sounds one-sided, I apologize to begin with. It's an instinct. I represent families and kids, uh, and I don't mean to offend uh, anyone. Uh, uh, I salute you. The law that we're dealing with is the Individuals with Disability in Education Act, uh, IDEA. That's the law that's the federal law that was created to ensure that public schools accommodated kids with disabilities. It is the evolution of the Education for Handicapped, uh, Education uh, for Handicapped for All Act, EHA, um, and that's really more historical than it is relevant right now, uh, but it's the evolution of that, and it's all generated 
essentially out of kind of the civil rights movement, the, the idea of inclusion for all, the idea that we are going to uh, accept differences and, and celebrate people's differences. Um, and that, that's really what you see in IDEA, is that we're bringing people into the fold. We're not going to exclude. And uh, you know, we could go through some of the, the legal underpinnings of it, but I think suffice to say that right now, we have three federal laws that cover kids with disabilities in public schools. IDEA, which is the first bullet, the second bullet, which is Section 504 of the Vocational Rehabilitation Act, and the third bullet, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act. And uh, for the lawyers in the room or those that need it, those are citations to the code, um, the, the United States Code. <clears throat> uh, these three laws combine to provide protections. And uh, just so you're aware, they don't do the same thing. Okay, uh, The way I like to explain it, and the best way I know to explain it, is that Section 504 and the ADA are what I'll call prohibitive laws. They prohibit discrimination. But IDEA is a prospective law, and it means that it's going to project what we do tomorrow to ensure that the child with a disability is receiving a free, appropriate public education. And so you have different, you have three laws, essentially you would say doing the same thing, ensuring accommodations. But they go about it a different way, and it's important for legal reasons as well as procedural reasons. Um, and it really, it, that's as far as we need to get with that right now. The other two laws I've listed in here are No Child Left Behind, which is not named that anymore. It's the back to the ESEA, Education Secondary Elementary Act, Elementary Secondary Education Act, excuse me, and FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Uh, everybody remembers No Child Left Behind for for maybe what you liked about it, what you didn't like about it. Uh, whatever your politics are, you have to be aware that it has changed the landscape of public education and made accountability and high stakes testing a priority. It's, it's also done a few other things with regards to kids with disabilities as far as funding. And it's, it's really actually a, a pretty interesting discussion about the way public schools can use funds that are specifically designated for specific populations and then combine those funds, maybe transfer those funds. But uh, the ESEA, uh, uh, make no mistakes, it, it impacts the role or the, uh, um, the treatment of kids with disabilities in public schools quite a bit. Uh, first and foremost is that it, it actually counts them and disaggregates groups and counts them. And students with disabilities, SWDs, are a disaggregated group that gets counted for high stakes testing purposes. And, and that has its own uh, consequences or ripple effects. Uh, FERPA is the, is the law dealing with the confidentiality of school records. And I know maybe some of you guys, this is very basic, uh, but you know, your school records or your child's school records or the child that you're working with school records are confidential. Um, they can only be disclosed for certain specific reasons, um, and they're listed in the statute. Um, the other interesting things that FERPA provides are that it requires that records be kept in a systematic way and that we be aware, or be, we be, as in citizens, be uh, allowed to know what that system is and identify what files exist, where the files are housed, and what they should have in them. And so it oftentimes will be a FERPA request, or excuse me, a request pursuant to FERPA to have something explained, like what is a principal's file? Or what's an investigative file? And where is that file kept? And what is the systematic way in which those records are kept? And through those types of uh, information requests, we can figure out essentially what the landscape of documents is because, I mean, you guys already know this is a document intensive practice. This is a document intensive area. Um, you know, I just was rummaging through an IEP this morning at 45 pages. I can't believe it. Uh, it took seven hours to create. I can't believe that. Uh, but this is what we do. Year after year, we continue to create IEPs that are pretty, uh, pretty heavy documents uh, with lots of information in them. Uh, and they are created and protected by FERPA as confidential. So I've given you the federal laws. And you should be aware that the federal laws are implemented by the states through what you know, some have called a system of cooperative federalism. Uh, IDEA is implemented by each individual state differently. And while they are similar in lots of respects, each state has the opportunity to uh, build on what the Congress has created at the federal level, to fill in some of the gaps that the Congress has left at the federal level, and then to collect data on the way that their systems work 
so they can report back to the Congress when IDEA gets amended. And IDEA gets amended actually, I think, quite frequently. And it's always, it always seems that we're either just coming out of an amendment or on the verge of another amendment where they're generated regulations at the federal level and generated regulations at the state level. And so this law, relatively speaking, stays in flux. And so the regulations that are created pursuant to the law also stay in flux. Um, the regulations in Georgia are found at uh, Georgia Comp Rules and Regs 164701. Um, actually, if you go onto the State Board website, and I should say the State Board does a great job of providing lots of information about special education on their special ed website. Uh, it's, it's an easy site to navigate. You can get right to the special education rules from uh, the special education part of the State Board's website. And it's IDDF 1 to 20, two thirds down the page. It's bookmarked on my computer. Um, for those that work in the area, I suggest printing out all 20, I think it's 21 regs with the definitions, tabbing them and bringing them to meetings. Because that's going to help you quite a bit in understanding what you should be saying, what it is that you're hearing, and what we should be doing next. And so I work with the regs um, most, uh, most intimately. Uh, the statute, not so much. And uh, when I have a question that's given to me by uh, any family in Atlanta, <laughs> lots of them, uh, the first place I start is at the regulations. And so this is where you want to really focus your energies when you're trying to figure out a, a, a problem to, or a special education problem. Um, there's the Georgia Board of Education rules, and I told you about IDDF. And in 2007, following the amendments to IDEA, the Georgia amended their rules. And that was an interesting time. The, the, the DOE <coughs> uh, solicited comment. The DOE had uh, proper administrative procedures uh, for changing the regulations. And then they rolled back our regulations all the way back to the federal uh, language. So really, with a few limited exceptions, our regulations now, the current, um, the current regulations that we have in Georgia, look almost verbatim uh, the federal regulations. And in a couple areas, that was significant. Um, one of the areas that I can, off the top of my head, think of is the idea of LRE. We had a really strong LRE rule. We actually had a case come out of Georgia, uh, go up to the 11th Circuit, that really was a, uh, a groundbreaker for, for LRE and the language that was going to be uh, you know, used to determine whether or not a child was being included. Least restrictive environment. A question came up, what is LRE? Here, I told you that it was going to be cryptic sometimes. Uh, the question came up, what is LRE? And that's least restrictive environment. Um, in an LRE case we had, uh, really built on uh, some, some legal uh, technical issues to, to create a strong rule for, for families uh, to ensure that kids are included to the maximum extent appropriate. Um, but that language is now gone. And that's just to kind of give you an example of how the law stays in flux. The amendments to the rules, or excuse me, the amendments to the statute at the federal level, uh, every, I think it's every seven years or so, seven to ten years, allow an opportunity for these rules to be reviewed by the citizenry and then changed again. And so that's what happened. We had lobby groups come out on both sides, and this is the result uh, at the regulation level. And I should say, when it's amended at that level, when the regulations are amended, it's really the most impactful amendment that, that I see. In, in the practice, uh, because that's the first thing that we go to as lawyers on each side to figure out what it is we're supposed to be doing at meetings uh, in front of the judge when we argue our cases. Uh, you may raise a good point. How many people have been to an IEP meeting? All right, so you know we're not 101 here. Maybe we're a little bit above that. Um, everybody has a, a basic understanding of you know the components of an IEP. You can just nod if you if you generally do, because we can. We can move the discussion a little bit above kind of the basics. Uh, so <clears throat> IDEA and kids in the courts. Statistics indicate that there's almost three quarters of all court-involved youth are either disabled or should have been identified as disabled. Um, and in a number of cases, either the party or the location of the offense is related to education. And I mean, just think to your own caseloads. I mean, it can all, and this is always my, when I step into juvenile court, this is always my, my presentation. You have a hard time not tracking it back to school. I mean, school is such a prevalent part of these kids' lives. I mean, you're there a third of the day. You're asleep a third of the day, I hope. And then a third of the day, you're either eating breakfast or dinner with your family or whoever you're with. So you've got, I mean, really, the majority of the time that you're learning, you're in school, or excuse me, that you're awake, you're in school. And so how, and if you weren't in school, you should have been in school. So it's really hard 
to pull the education piece out. And this is one of the things when I talk to people that work in child welfare um, who don't always have time to think about the implications on school um, is, to, is to really slow them down and to, to consider the educational component. I can give you a story. I had a kid that was in a stable environment uh, for, I believe, two years. Something happened in school. The school issued a uh, disciplinary order to change the, the child's placement to an alternative school. The child's placement changed alternative school, but the foster parent couldn't get the child to that school. Instead of working through that transportation problem, the caseworker moved the child's placement, kind of a knee jerk. You can't get to school, you can't stay here, even though they were in a stable placement for two years. What happened next was completely unforeseen, but horrendous. They move the placement to a new placement. The child is in sexually abused in the new placement and drops out altogether. Now, you can't make the connection that one caused the other, but gosh, if you're in a stable placement for two years, you might want to consider, and you're doing you know, generally OK, you might want to consider a, another solution to that education piece before we change the home piece. And that's how one affects the other. And you can't pull them out. You can't pull it apart and say home and school are separate. We'll deal with one, and then we'll deal with the other, because they, by inherent, they are inherently intertwined. I mean, that where you are is where you go to school, and you just can't change that. So it's really uh, either the offense or, or the party is, is uh, in, a, in a, I'd say, 80% of the cases that I deal with, um, there's a school issue. And if there isn't, it isn't right up there on the front, if you dig a little bit, you'll find that it exists someplace. For children and child welfare, many times the educational indisability undermines the efforts to secure a stable home environment. I just gave you an example. But when it comes to <clears throat> having difficulties in school, that doesn't just happen at school and then you go home and everything's fine. When you're having difficulties in school, perhaps there's an undiagnosed disability, perhaps there's some social challenges, perhaps it's just the, trans the, the transience of the, the school placements. Uh, when you have those difficulties, it makes you a sad person. It makes you somebody that's stressed out, that's having these anxieties related to school. That's going to come out someplace, and oftentimes it'll come out in the home placement. So you can't just say, that's the school's problem. We'll deal, the school will deal with that, and then we'll move on with the home placement. You have to consider school. So I've given you the framework of the laws, IDEA, Section 504, and the ADA combine to create a system or a process which we call special education. Special education, maybe you guys have heard all, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I've been following the, uh, the Charter School Commission case. Anybody have been following that case? You know, special's got a new meaning now, doesn't it? It's really an important word. Nobody ever knew. But uh, in fact, the, the arguments in that case boiled, came back to what special means in special education. And is that just for that population? And, uh, there were some very strong arguments made on both sides about what those words mean, but and here we are. Special education is. Special education, under the regulations in the law, the definition is specially designed instruction provided at no cost to the parent that meets the unique needs of a student with a disability. It includes instruction in the classroom, in the home, in hospitals, institutions, and other settings, and then you see the rest of the, the definition. The most important part <clears throat> Or there are several important parts of the definition. Um, this is obviously a term of art. It's defined under the statute. And actually, unfortunately for us, it contains several other terms of art in it. So special education is specially designed instruction. That is actually defined itself in the code, uh, provided at no cost to the parents that, and then here we are, meets the unique needs of a student with a disability. This definition essentially sets out what the mandate is for schools uh, with regards to kids with disabilities, and that is that they provide the child a free, at no cost to the parent, appropriate, meeting the unique needs of the student, public, meaning it comes from the public school education, and then you have the, the education including instruction in the classroom, in the home, in hospitals, institutions, and other settings. And so free, appropriate, public education. That's an acronym that stands and it spells out FAPE. And you may hear FAPE thrown around. Uh, quite a bit in special education uh, procedures. This is where it's derived from. It's derived from the definition of special education. And so special education is this. It is the system by which a public school will slow down, 
consider each individual child, determine whether or not that child is a child with a disability, and whether or not that child with a disability requires unique and individualized instruction. Once you've done that, and you, the answer is yes, you move on to what that individual instruction would consist of. And that's what special education is. <clears throat> and now that I've had the show of hands, I'm, I think this slide may be a little basic, but I like to say it just because. Special education is not the short bus. And everybody chuckles, but it's still the, the stigma. It's still the public perception that it is. Okay? It's not. You don't have to ride the short bus if you're in special education. It's not an automatic. If you require that accommodation, then you will. But when I talk to my clients, I have to give this, 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 I have to give this, this little speech. I have to have this discussion because people don't get it. And your clients won't get it. And that's why it's necessary to have this. That is not what it means anymore. We have moved beyond that. Our system of education has evolved to ensure that all kids with disabilities are included. The short bus, to me, is the way they exclude them. And in their minds, when you hear special education, that's what they think. They being the clients that we work with. And so it's really important that you give this talk, that you say it doesn't mean you're going to automatically be excluded. It doesn't mean that you're not going to get to play sports. It doesn't mean that you're not going to go to the regular classrooms and you're just going to be in some portable that's often the hinterlands of the school. That's simply not what it means. And to, and to interpret it otherwise is illegal. That easy. We don't start there. That may be where it ends up for whatever reason. You may end up on a special ed or on a, uh, a bus for kids with disabilities. Or you may end up in a portable in the school. But the presumption is, and the law says, that we start with the idea that everybody's educated together. And we move from there as appropriate. Not the short bus. Not the portable in the back of the school. It's definitely not a separate classroom for the entire day. <clears throat> and it's not a permanent roadblock to getting a high school diploma. Uh, in fact, for anybody that's been to an IEP meeting, uh, you know, I mean, and it's kind of, it's almost silly at some point in some of these discussions when you have uh, 13 and 14 year olds that are moving into high school, they have a discussion of the diploma. Because we start with the presumption that we're all going to receive a regular diploma. Uh, and it makes good sense, especially under uh, No Child Left Behind mandates, that we would. Because we need all those kids to be taking the high stakes tests, and it, up until recently the Georgia High School graduation test and the end of course tests. We need them all to be counted. We need them all to receive these educational uh, services so that they can pass those tests. And so it makes sense that we would, as a state, want our kids to receive a regular education diploma. And so just because you're receiving special education does not automatically mean you're not going to receive a regular ed diploma. Good. And here we are, the special education process. And you may have gone to other talks, and I, I don't have my, my little uh, copyright. Is it copyright or trademark? I can't remember. I don't have it on there. Uh, but this is my own way of breaking down IDEA so that it makes sense. Um, and I've gotten good feedback on it, so hopefully it'll work for you. Uh, it's a four-step process. Identification, evaluation, eligibility, and placement. And for the most part, any issue that you, uh, in, that you come into contact with in special education, you can identify or uh, label into one of these, categorize into one of these four steps. It's a four-step process that ends ultimately, if you've gone through it correctly, with the creation of an individualized education plan, an IEP. An IEP is the statement, by, is the statement of the collaborative decision uh, that a family and a school have made to, to determine how, or to say how they will educate a disabled kid in public school. And so the placement is both the services that the child is receiving, and then where on the continuum of educational placements will those services be provided and that is given to you through the IEP, which is the document that has that information. <clears throat> and this is kind of a, uh, just a, a place to break a little bit and talk. Special education for court-involved youth oftentimes can be that missing piece. And I've given you some examples of, of how school and, and, and child welfare and school and, and other uh, things that happen outside of school uh, can interact. But 
when we don't think about whether or not the kid is a kid with a disability and whether or not he needs an accommodation, I think that we're possibly missing a major piece to the puzzle. Um, accommodate the disability, uh, accommodate the reading disorder. Okay? Kid has dyslexia, kid has, you know, refuses to go to his fifth period English class. Accommodate that disability. Get that child some specific reading instruction. Get the kid from you know, a pre-primer level up to a fourth grade level in a couple years. You'll start seeing him go to school more. You'll build on that success. You'll see increased self-esteem. You'll probably see a more stable outside of school kid just because you worked on the disability. And I oversimplify, but really that's what we're talking about when I say missing piece of the puzzle. <clears throat> Uh, it may open a dialogue between school and court. And I know that this is uh, may. <laughs> uh, this has been an issue that we've been working on for the last 10 years, is to getting the court and the school to speak the same language. And at Fulton County, we started the Educational Advocacy Committee and put an educational advocate in place to try to help bridge that gap. Um, for you guys that are in the field, you're the person that's going to need to speak both languages. You need to be the interpreter. Because when you come to court to talk about school or to present to the judge about you know, a placement and the stability of the placement, you're also going to be talking about school. You're the person that's going to have to have the judge understand or help the judge to understand what is or isn't going on. And if you can make it understandable in terms of special education, if, uh, if that's the way it, it needs to happen, uh, I think that you're giving the judge more information and bringing the judge, essentially, if you can visualize it, out from behind the bench and putting them in the classroom so they can see it uh, with documents, with discussions of meetings, um, with, with progress reports. That's the way that you can bridge this gap so that a judge who's trying to make decisions about what to do with this child can understand, you know, eight hours they're sleeping, eight hours they're in school. Now I understand at least eight and the eight that the kid's awake. 16 hours this kid's day, what's going on? Right? Because you can tell them about the home. You can tell them about breakfast and dinner. Um, and then learn about the school, get the documents from the school, understand about the progress that's being made in school, and you're providing them a better picture. <clears throat> and for parents, and this is always the case, uh, special education empowers them with rights to ensure meaningful participation. And maybe not for our child welfare specifically, uh, but for you know, a good majority of the kids that I work with, being able to help a family understand this law and advocate for the, the rights of their disabled child, it does wonders for that family. It gives them the opportunity to really pull some levers that they, they never knew they had. And when you do that, you're teaching them how to pull levers. And when you do that, you're giving them some self-sufficiency. So hopefully, if you are in my position, and I tell every family that I advocate for, so watch me and listen to what I'm doing because I won't always be here. And I'll be your kid's advocate for maybe a year, but you're the kid's advocate for the rest of his life. So you need to be able to do what I'm doing, be it at school, be it with mental health, be it with a child placement, whatever it is, you have to be the advocate parent. And that's what I tell them. And this is their opportunity, one of the rare opportunities they can see a very quick impact. I mean, you ask for the service, you have an evaluation that says the service is appropriate, boom. The school has the resource. They can provide the service. They can do it. And they will do it if it's appropriate. And it's, it's really, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very empowering thing for families. And that's one of the, the parts of my job that I do enjoy. And I've set, I've set a few future advocates on their way. They've watched me, and then they've gone back out into the community. And, and I've heard back, they're doing OK, you know? But uh, it is. It's something that I think helps families uh, in, in a place where sometimes they don't often feel empowered. <clears throat> I told you about FAPE. FAPE is what we argue about as lawyers. But you should know that it is the mandate that public school, on public schools uh, to accommodate disabled kids. It has to be free, and that means without charge. It has to be appropriate, and that means that it conforms with the requirements of IDEA, and this is directly from the language of the, the rule. Um, it meets the unique needs of the child and confers educational benefit. It has to be at the public expense. It has to be totally free. There cannot, it cannot cost a family one cent. It cannot cost a family one cent against maybe their private insurance. 
copays, deductibles, cannot cost the family one red cent. Um, that doesn't mean that a school can't ask in some situations to bill back to insurance, um, but it has to be free. Ultimately, it has to be totally free. And it, education means, uh, and I gave you the definition, and maybe this is something I should, should elaborate on. <clears throat> education isn't what you always thought it was. When we went to school, or maybe as you contemplated it, it was reading and writing, arithmetic, ABCs and one, two, threes. Uh, you had lunch, and then you went home. Uh, for kids with disabilities, education means much more than that. It means being an independent person, ultimately. There are several domains that I call them domains of education. Um, but they ultimately result in having an independent person. And remember that the goal of education is to, ha is to feed into our democratic society. So that goes for people with disability. We want people to get out of school, to be independent people, to be uh, socialized and ready to vote and participate in our democratic process, which means get a job, go out, and all the rest. Um, what's important about IDEA that possibly uh, you wouldn't know right off the bat is that it covers kids from three, which is, if anybody's got kids, maybe you do, I do, uh, that means before you get to kindergarten. So that's three, preschool, to 21. And if you've got older kids, that means after you graduated high school. So if you have a disability, and if you're a baby with a disability, uh, you, you are covered by IDEA from zero to three, as well as from three to 21. Um, if you have an older child who is possibly in high school uh, and has not, uh, or is not prepared to transition out to a post-secondary world, um, they have the opportunity to receive their educational services until they're 22. And so three through age 21 is why it's written that way. Um, <clears throat> I said zero to three. I should just add as an aside, there's two parts of IDEA, part B and part C. Part B covers kids three, sorry, three through 22. Uh, part C is, uh, is the early intervention part of IDEA, zero to three. In Georgia, that's dealt with through Babies Can't Wait. And so Babies Can't Wait actually administers or yeah, administers IDEA Part B, Part C, excuse me. <clears throat> so yeah, we're doing all right. So the four-step process starts with identification. And that, in uh, special ed terms, has been coined child find. And there's basically, schools have an affirmative obligation to sift through every kid in their geographic area, every kid, when they're three, mm -hmm. when they're three, and find those kids who are suspected of having a disability. And those kids that are suspected of having a disability, they are required to identify, locate, and evaluate. And so that's what child find means. And that's as, as simply put as I can, as I can do it. Uh, identify and locate may seem to be redundant, but it's not. Uh, because think about where kids are when they're three. They're not in school. They're in daycares. They're in people's homes. And so the school has an affirmative obligation to get out into the community and to find where these disabled kids are and ensure that if they are uh, disabled and in need of special education, that an IEP is developed. And that actually does happen. Uh, Schools do public service announcements. Schools talk to pediatricians. They talk to um, uh, daycare centers. Uh, you'll see pamphlets. You'll, you'll hear about kind of at, at, a, uh, at a very high level there being interagency discussions about this. It does happen. But there are times when there will be a disabled child come through the courts where there has been no babies can't wait referral. There is no case manager involved. And you have you know, a three-year-old who has some significant needs that have co completely been missed. And so a school has the obligation to find that kid, to identify them, and then to have them evaluated uh, if they are uh, suspected of be having a disability. And that's child find. Up until 2008, I think, child find was completed in Georgia, or the child find mandate was completed in Georgia through the student support team process. And if you've ever been to an SST meeting, uh, you, you know, you understand where I'm coming from on this. SST is very soft compared to IDEA IEP meetings. Uh, the regulation on SST is as soft as it, it turns out at the meetings. There is no uh, requi legal requirement for things to be done. Um, and in fact, the SST chair position at a school is an unfunded position. It's just a teacher that's been assigned an extra duty. 
And usually they, co they combine them with the 504 coordinator. So you have an SST 504 coordinator. And so, you know, that's a lot of work. And so before 2008, SST was the only mechanism that was being employed uh, to determine whether or not a child was a child uh, suspected of having a disability and to move that child through the process from identification to evaluation. That changed when IDEA was amended in 2004 and those regulations trickled down into 2007. Um, it changed mostly because, well, there's a few reasons, but generally it changed because we turned into a data-driven educational society. Decisions weren't going to be made on the instincts of educators alone. We were going to now require that we use data. And to use data means that you have to collect it and analyze it. And so, and we became a data-driven educational society. Um, <clears throat> that being said, um, the Congress, recognizing that we're not going to go on the, the gut instincts of educators anymore, we're going to require numbers, um, started moving our identification system to what's called a response to intervention uh, model. The response to intervention model at the federal level was required only for kids with learning disabilities. But because the, the ideas or the concepts that are involved in a response to intervention model can be applied across the board, uh, Georgia created rules and regulations and a system um, to ensure that every kid was, was getting this response to intervention um, idea or concept applied in their situation. And the way in which Georgia has done this, and maybe you've heard these terms, is by creating a pyramid of interventions. Interventions are the educational techniques or services that we are going to provide pre-special education and then track to see what kind of response we get from the kid. If the kid does not respond to our regular ed interventions, tutoring, uh, block scheduling, um, great ones right now, some basic accommodations, um, if they don't respond to that and their educational performance stays static, well then we continue up the pyramid of interventions. If we see positive response to our interventions, then we know that they've worked and the child does not have any other uh, needs right now. We've, we've answered the problem or the educational deficiency. The pyramid of interventions, let's stay right here for a second, I'm jumping around. Uh, the pyramid of interventions uh, was employed not to replace SST, but actually to ensure that there were things being done pre an SST meeting so that we had data collected that will improve our decision making. And that was why we have the pyramid of interventions, and that's what Child Find is. And I'll talk a little bit more about it as, as we go along. Maybe you guys have the benefits of the slides, I don't. Um, <clears throat> who requires special education? Who needs special education? What should uh, a school be looking for? What is it that's going to uh, confer eligibility uh, as they're sifting through the entire population of kids in their geographic area? And this is the definition uh, of, uh, uh, of a child with a disability. And this is the definition taken from the regulation and the rule, uh, or excuse me, the statute. And that you see there's a list. And actually, this list uh, tracks the categories of eligibility for Georgia uh, special education. Um, and so I won't read them to you. Uh, but what's most important about the rule of a child, what is a child with a disability, is that not only do you have this disabling condition, um, but, and I underlined it for you, by reason thereof, you need special education and related service. And so it's not enough to be ADHD. You have to have some connection from that ADHD to your educational performance. It has to Im adversely impact your educational performance. Um, and so, there you are, you have the, the, the rule for who needs special education. <clears throat> yeah? No, speech and language impairment is actually talking about uh, the length, go ahead. Uh, the question was, uh, when I'm talking about, and when the, rules, uh, when the rule identifies speech language impairment, um, the third one there, um, what is that referring to? Is that referring to English as spoken as a second language? Um, no, actually what's that refer what that's referring to is um, a processing delay that affects your language. And it manifests in several ways, but there's usually, uh, it's characterized by either a, uh, an expressive delay, 
a receptive delay, uh, an articulation problem. Uh, I think that covers them. Um, and, and that's what it's referring to when you have a speech language impairment. And the, what it would look like in the field is, and I had a client who took, uh, the speech language uh, therapist told me, she took 12 seconds to process the verbal information that was being provided to her, which socially is really difficult. Because how can you have a conversation if I told you hello and it took you 12 seconds to figure out that I just told you hello? And so she had a really significant receptive delay um, where she could not process that information between her ears to use that information in whatever other function that she was doing. And that's what it's referring to. And it's addressed specifically through speech language therapy. <clears throat> Child find and behavior, and we're kind of tacking back to the pyramid of interventions and um, how we identify kids with disabilities. Um, it's, a, it's probably one of the hardest things that I do are behavior cases. Um, it is as challenging an area of science and education and, and, and medicine that you'll find. And there is really, I mean, there's no definitive way to ensure a positive outcome. It's just I think I've got a handle on it. I think I've got a great IEP. I've got supports in place. I got somebody walking with my kid, class to class, sitting in the seat, at lunch, getting him on the bus. Who's going to take care of him when he's at home? Who's going to take care of him when he's out in the street? Especially the clients that we serve. Uh, who's going to take care of those kids every minute of the day to ensure that this behavioral manifestation of disability is, is being accommodated? Um, and when it's not accommodated, the you know, the consequences, the ripple from that, is pretty significant. You go to jail, you know. I've got clients that have been in, in their um, apartment complexes getting evicted for things that they have done, and it takes a letter from us to say, look, this is, this is who he is as a child. He has this disability. This is a clear manifestation of that. And when you evicted the family because of what he did, you discriminated against him. Oh, oh, I didn't. I had no idea. Yeah, you didn't. It's really hard. I mean, you can't just, it's just almost impossible. And so behavior by its nature, because it's not a science, like we, you know, I think we've gotten reading down. Reading's the thing. We start with the building blocks of reading, the phonological awareness. We build on that. We build on letter word, con letter sound concept. Where, I mean, it's great. I, I get the science. Behavior, it's hard. I mean, you can go down to the Marcus Center. They'll tell you the same thing. It's hard. Um, and the escalation of negative behaviors can be evidence of the need for individualized instruction. Um, this is an arguing point. Schools can say the escalation of behaviors is willful. It has nothing to do with the disability. And so we have you know, a tough time persuading uh, administrators, maybe less enlightened administrators, maybe administrators that are under stress of you know, high stakes testing and keeping order and safety in their classrooms to slow down and consider that this may be a disability. Uh, and, you know, I give you my own bits of wisdom. When schools tell me that this is a, a kid whose behavior has gone off the charts, is terrible, is not doing anything that he's being told, I say when you point the finger, you have three pointing right back at you. We're all responsible for what's going on for this disabled kid. And if it's not working and the behaviors are escalating, to me, that's evidence that we haven't done the right thing in the IEP. And, you know, that's just, you know, simply, like I said, it's hard. You know, you can't just sit and say, kids misbehaving, we're off the hook. And you can't sit a stakeholder and say, kids misbehaving, what can I do, judge? You know, we have to continue to go back to the board and try to find a, a solution. And it's, you know, it's really, it's a challenge. Um, and the last bullet, I don't think that's, uh, that's not brain surgery for anybody. I think we all get that. That's educational crisis. And I think the part of this that's really a challenge is to, to identify educational crisis and then relate it back to the procedures that are in place to ensure that we can, one, stop the crisis, and then two, not have it again. I think we all, you know, and I, I see this happen a lot in court, you know, suspension, suspension, expulsion to alternative school, alternative school out into the street. All of those, all of that to me is evidence that if we haven't accommodated this ability, that you haven't gotten appropriate instruction. Behavior instruction is instruction. Remember I told you how there's all these domains in education? Teaching somebody how to behave is one of them. And so this
This is a part of what the IEP is built to do. Okay. So I told you <coughs> Georgia did child fine through the SST. Um, this, there is a rule in place, and I give you the site. Uh, how many people have been to SST meeting? Less than the IEP. That's interesting. Uh, well, you don't have to go to an S SST meeting to move through the special education process. You used to, uh, before the pyramid of interventions were, were in place, I think it was uh, probably we had more SST meetings. But now we've kind of gotten the data collected at, at Tier 1 and Tier 2. Tier 3 seems to be, you know, Either you are or you're not by the time you get there and then you move into special education, which is tier four. Ah, that's my pyramid of interventions. Boy, it looks good there, doesn't it? <laughs> right on. You have it in your materials and it's on the state board website. And in fact, there is the special education manual has an entire chapter on the pyramid of interventions that the state boards put out. This, is, this icon or this graphic is from that. And it's, it's a good explanation, a good objective explanation of how, SS, or excuse me, how the pyramid of interventions are supposed to be implemented. <clears throat> okay. Boy, I'm, I'm not making much ground, am I? Um, so the pyramid of interventions, uh, I'll, I'll go generally, and if you want more, please let me know. Uh, but tier one is, is every kid. Every kid gets uh, standardized, or excuse me, the Georgia Performance Standards, which is a... Um, a research-based scientific curriculum that's provided for every kid. And from there, we determine who are our at-risk kids by a virtue of where they go to school, their socioeconomic situation, or perhaps their performance early on. And we do that systematically. Um, Title I schools get, get more money for interventions at a, at a Tier 1, Tier 2 level because they have ki more kids that would be considered at risk. Um, but that's not the only way that you can... Um, access tier two, uh, but you'll, you'll have those at-risk kids, and those kids will rise up to tier two, where we provide uh, system-wide, school-wide interventions uh, to ensure that those kids that are at risk, uh, and when I say at risk, at risk of not performing up to the Georgia performance standards as indicated by high-stakes tests. Um, when you're not performing up to performance standards, the Georgia performance standards, um, then you're at risk or you've identified an educational deficiency that can be addressed through an intervention. Tier 2 interventions are things like a school will shuffle their schedule to put two reading blocks together. Um, they'll provide Saturday instruction or after school instruction. Um, they may, nah, I'm going to blank on some other ones. Those are the major ones. Um, they will do things school-wide and the point is that it's not individual to any particular kid. Um, and, and give those opportunities for enrichment to, to try to address educational deficiencies and bring those at-risk kids up to performance standards. Um, for those kids that receive those interventions um, but still do not close that deficiency or that, that gap, those kids will then rise up to Tier 3. And Tier 3 is what's called uh, Student Support Team Learning, SST Learning. Tier 2 is called Standards Learning, I believe. Uh, I think I might have that wrong. Uh, but they'll move up to Tier 3. And at Tier 3 is when these interventions become individualized to the kid. Um, the other things that happen uh, from Tier 2 to Tier 3 are that the data is taken more frequently. And the, uh, the implication for all of this is that, one, we're providing a curriculum that's consistent um, and done with fidelity to whatever the methodology is. And so we've provided it as it's supposed to be provided and consistently to every kid. And then we take data on it. And at tier two, we take less data or data points aren't as frequent. At tier three, we take quite a bit of data. And in fact, I believe the state board recommendation is that you take data every eight weeks, six to eight weeks, um, and review the data to determine whether or not there's been a response to intervention. Um, and from that data and that discussion at the SST meeting, from that failure to respond to the interventions, we get a referral for evaluation from Tier 3 to Tier 4, and Tier 4 is special education learning. That evaluation is the second step in special education. Yeah. I'll repeat it for you. Yeah. Um,
all school in all schools in all school districts. Chapter. If you read the language of the chapter involved, I mean, it doesn't exactly say that. And I'm just trying to figure out: is are, is it your sense that each, in particular, each elementary school in Georgia implements an RTI program? Uh, it's a good question. Is it absolutely certain from the regulation and the law that RTI is required for every kid? Um, and I should say, that's not my understanding. This is my understanding that this is a system that's been created by the state board um, and implemented through the locals, not through a mandate, but through a best practice, essentially. This is the way in which we do child find. Um, and in fact, I think if you went by the letter of the law, Response to intervention and eligibility is only uh, applied for kids with learning disabilities. And really, that is uh, both the statute and the regulations say that when you're going to use the response to intervention model, it's for kids that are manifesting a learning disability, and you're trying to make that eligibility determination. Uh, I can tell you that all metro counties uh, painfully drag us through a response to intervention analysis when they do eligibility for any. Uh, uh, category of eligibility. Um, we have that discussion sometimes. This isn't required. And, and I think the way that you can know that it's not required is the fact that you can bypass response to intervention and the peer of interventions anytime the disability is severe enough and you have that documentation. Um, there's no need to go through, and this is a, an important practice point for, and I'm glad you brought it up, uh, for, our, for our stakeholders and people in the field. There's no need to go through 32 weeks of data collection for a child that has an, into, has an IQ of 50, a, two adaptive scores of 50, and is clearly intellectually disabled. We don't have to do that. There's no need to go through 32 weeks of data collection for a kindergartner who gets hit by a drunk driver and has traumatic brain injury and comes back to school eight weeks later clearly disabled. The state board says it's not required. Uh, there's no rule and there's no law that says it's required. And the only reason I slow down to make you guys hear this is so that you go into the field and explain to whoever it is that told you we have to wait, uh, I think it's 12 weeks for an evaluation, or we wait 12 weeks to collect the data and then we'll refer to evaluation for a kid who's obviously got a severe disability. Um, so you can tell them. Uh, because I think, and this draws on uh, some miscommunication that came down from the state a few years ago that the state's really been working hard to try to uh, eliminate across Georgia. Um, there's no need. Response intervention doesn't require that you wait. It requires that you review data, any data. If you have data, you can review it and then evaluate. You can evaluate and then review the data that you have. You do not have to, at some, you know, you know, very formalistic way say, okay, today we're starting to take data and 12 weeks from now we'll review it and refer for evaluation. That's not what the regulation says and that's not what the state board says. Yeah? When you say review any data, does that mean that if the parents, if you've got medical records that say child is paralyzed on one side, do I really need a microphone? D child no longer has useful movement of the left side, that that is the significant data. It doesn't have to be educationally procured. I would actually, uh, I would categorize that a little differently. I'd say that's information. That's evaluative information that would be relevant for a determination of eligibility. Um, and that goes in the category of you're so severe that we don't need to go through any of the pyramid of interventions, uh, you know, medical, medical infirmity or uh, orthopedic impairment. Um, you become blind or vision impaired. Um, when I talk about educational data, it's usually on the not as clear cases where a kid has a learning disability, a kid has some you know, uh, behavioral manifestations, and they want to look at 12 weeks of data. The state board says, if you have data already, like um, you've implemented some behavior modifications, and then you've tracked whether or not those modifications have you know, uh, affected the behavior, uh, and this is, this is always a good question nobody's asked, what is data? <laughs> this is the checklists, uh, you know, time of day and date, and every time the child shows the target behavior, you put a tick, you put a little mark, and then you go and review whether the marks increase by time and day or decrease by time and day. Um, looking at that, and you had you know, several weeks of that data, that's educational data. Does the child know his ABCs? You know, and you've provided some regular ed interventions where you've given them more time, you've gone to Saturday school, uh, you've put them in the front of the class or close to the teacher, um, and then you check them. You go back and review, did you, you, know, you didn't know A, big A, and little a, and the sound for which, um, and now you do. 
and we checked you three times over the last eight weeks, and now you do. Well, the intervention worked. That's data. Um, you should see that when you go to review a kid's educational records. If it's not there, you should ask for it, because that's going to be what's driving the decision making in special education. Okay. <clears throat> Second step in the four-step process is evaluation, and now we've gotten to the place where the parents, the family, or excuse me, the parents, the school members of the team, uh, somebody else has identified a deficiency or an educational delay that uh, would not be addressed with a, re a regular intervention. The child may need unique and individualized instruction. The step, the, the IDEA contemplates moving through evaluation to determine eligibility. Evaluations um, <clears throat> are really what drive special education planning. Um, it's, it's part of the information that a team relies on when they make decisions about the kid. And it's really a big part of the information or the body of information that you have to give you the picture of the kid that you're advocating for. Um, family comes to me and they give me a really long story. It's a very interesting story and it's, you know, it's got all kinds of ins and outs of who did what to who and this and that. And At the end of that story, it's taken 20 minutes, but I say, can you bring me all your evaluations? Bring me your last IEP? Because that's what's going to tell me what's going on. Uh, you know, there will be a lot of factual things that go on in the background, but that's what you need to be able to identify or pick out what is this kid, who is this kid, how does this kid learn, or why, you know, what it is about this kid that's delayed. Um, evaluations. Schools are responsible for ensuring that a child suspected of having a disability is provided a full an individual evaluation in all areas of suspected disability. And they are the basis for conferring eligibility and creating the plan. Go ahead. When a child's court involved, many times we'll get, we'll court order evaluations of physical health, mental health, educational status, all kinds of things. So are, can those be used by the school or do they have to have an independent evaluation? And, and the, uh, you had the microphone. Um, and the question is, the evaluation is an evaluation, but is it the right evaluation? Um, and I'll say that the rules contemplate receiving information from a variety of sources. And while the school will receive that information, or IEP team can, or a planning team, any school planning team can, content, or can receive that information and, and, and use it to help their decision making, it may not be all the information. And really, I think what, what holds up a lot of the discussions is stakeholders, people in the field say, here's your evaluation, let's move forward with eligibility, and the school say, well, that's really not going to be sufficient. And I think what the stakeholders are hearing is, this evaluation won't do it. Um, you have to do a, quote, school evaluation. But really what the school is saying is there are specific pieces of information that have to be evaluated or assessed before we can make, you know, go forward with decision making. Um, and that's not the same as your evaluation won't work. And in fact, when you look at the eligibility rules for several of the categories, it's evaluative information that is, is only going to be received, especially when you deal with kids with autism. It's evaluative information that is, is primary. And so that court evaluation can be used, but whether or not it's completely sufficient to allow a team to make a decision on eligibility, that's the, different, that's the piece of the puzzle that we don't know. And I'll say, as advocates in the field, you know, there, there are lots of different reasons why you want to move a school through evaluation. I mean, for my money, I want them to evaluate because that's what they're supposed to do. That's their job. IDEA says evaluate and then we determine eligibility. I may have, you know, lots of different reasons that the child was evaluated that have very little to do with educational planning. And that's going to give us some information that may or may not be helpful at an IEP table. I want the school to do it. And you know, there is a delay that's involved with that. They don't move as fast as we want them to. You know, they don't move as fast as they wish they did. Um, but there's a delay that's involved. Uh, that's part of it. You know, go, go, go ahead. Uh, I'll, let me finish the thought. That's part of it. But the benefit that you get from a school evaluation may outweigh the delay in the long run. Um, that's not the only way to get that information in front of an IEP team. Go ahead. Yes, sir. I apologize. Uh, I got a question. I, we work for uh, DFACS, 
and we have foster kids that are transient. They move around a lot uh, in the state. I guess the problem that we have a lot of times is that um, the kids are moving moving around so much that their IEP is not following them from school mm -hmm. to school. Uh, I had a student that was in a school in DeKalb, and he moved to um, a school in South Fulton. When he got to the school, they didn't realize that the child needed to be in um, special ed. He was in interrelated classes, and after three or four weeks of disruption, uh, they finally called the IEP. And I went to him and I asked him, I said, why didn't we do that before? Or why didn't his records follow him from the school that he was in prior to that? So I think that's one thing with foster parent, foster kids is a little different um, because they, these kids move around so much. And if someone is not there advocating for them, um, then those kids fall through the cracks. So they'll end up being in the wrong classes a lot of time for a long period of time before they even realize that, hey, this child's IEP is not, not here with them. You see what I'm saying? One second. I think that that's a very good question, but if when you answer that, I'd like you to ask also address the fact that sometimes children get started in the SST or IT or RTI process, and that's somewhere along the way, and then they change schools or even counties, and the school sometimes wants to start that all over again, and that can be an argument as well. So if you could address, um, certainly the IEP should follow, but also some of that pre-IEP data, yeah. how to ensure that that follows more effectively. Great. And what we're talking about now is the difficulties that we had in kids with child welfare moving county to county, or maybe you know, even state to county. Um, and the first answer I have is that special ed laws apply to all kids everywhere they're at, and they're entitled to special education services every day that they're in school. Okay? That means they're entitled to an appropriate education every day they're in school. Uh, they may not have a lawyer that's able to assert their right to a remedy because they were denied the special education service. Um, but the regulations say that those documents, and we'll get through transfer of records, have to be transferred. And you know, fostering connections did a good job of shoring up this piece of the transfer of records by requiring that you know, people in child welfare, as well as the Department of Education, be responsible for those records moving county to county. Um, when you move county to county, uh, the IEP that follows you is to be implemented right away. Now, that county receiving the child has, has the option. They can implement that IEP as it is, or they can reevaluate and then go back to the IEP table to determine services. Um, it is not, there is no excuse, there is no exception to FAPE for kids in child welfare because you're only in the school district for a certain amount of time or that you may be leaving the school district uh, in, a certain, in a few days or that we perceive you won't be here very long. Um, it's just not acceptable. Um, and you know, you'll be told by the State Department of Education that it's not acceptable. That's not compliance. Um, <clears throat> the best way to advocate in a situation like that is to get people to the table as quickly as possible. Um, and you cannot, and this is unfortunate, um, but you know, there's just a lot of kids in Georgia and schools, uh, for whatever reason, don't move as fast as we'd like them to for our kids because our kids are the ones that are going to be in crisis quicker. Um, they, it'll be on us to take the first step, the second step, and the next step um, until we get everybody to the IEP table. I'm sure then the situation that you raise that once you did some advocacy and got people to the table, they, they recognized the mistake and fixed it. Um, I would add on to that, at that point, if there was a denial of FAPE, that the child should be receiving compensatory education. If the child was supposed to receive speech during that time, OT during that time, a specific reading methodology during that time, they should receive that in a compensatory basis to close the achievement gap that was created by the denial of FAPE. And that's, that's the standard in the regulation. Uh, when it comes to SST, and that, I, I used to give the talk, and when I have more time, a whole day, I do, uh, about the stalled SST. That's not new. We've had stalled SSTs since I've been in Georgia. Um, that's not new, and it's not going away. Um, and it's even, bad, it's even worse for kids that move uh, district to district or kids that are going into a facility and out of a facility. Um, uh, the best advice that I can give or advocacy uh, point that I can give is that you keep that record, you put that record in front of a school, and then you tell the school that there is sufficient data for us to move forward with an evaluation. This would be one of those situations where an outside evaluation, maybe one from a court psychologist, would be helpful because that would 
fill in a few pieces of the puzzle for the school and get them off of the stalled SST uh, moving forward to a referral for evaluation. That's not to say that schools will not stall IEPs. I have had more meeting, IE, more, excuse me, stall SSTs, more meeting SST1 for the same kid over the three years than you, know, you guys, the number of people you in this room. Okay, that's just what happens. Um, there's not enough, I think, uh, available days uh, for whatever reason uh, to make this process work. You know, we get close to uh, Thanksgiving, things slow down. Christmas comes, things stop. Get close to spring break, things slow down. We're, you know, if you're in April, it's basically summer um, as far as SST planning goes. Um, that's just what people, that, that, you, know, and for, you know, we understand. You know, that's the mentality that you have. Um, and so that's going to be, again, on us to move the, the process forward. I go, I go so far as to, and, and this is only for specific situations, I'll propose interventions. I'll say, here's my plan to SST. Let's meet and implement it. Here's my interventions. Let's meet and implement it. Here's the IEP from Bartow, DeKalb. Um, you got it. Let's move. You know, take those steps that even though the regulation says we don't have to, uh, we go the one step further for the kid so that we can move them along. Because we know that if we leave it to chance, you know, they'll be hoping for, for winter break. So. Oh, you guys got me now. I'm behind the eight ball here. Um, the points on evaluation, and, and I'm going to move a little bit quicker, are that they're full and individual, meaning that they're identify or they're assessing all of the areas that are suspected of disability. It's not enough just to take an IQ test. It's not enough just to do uh, some BAS scale, some ADHD scales. You have to do full and individual evaluation in all areas of suspected disability. This is an important note. That includes communication and speech. Speech, that includes occupational therapy or physical therapy. And actually, the little known secret that schools would not want us to know, that includes medical issues for evaluative purposes. That's a related service. If there are medical issues like ADHD, a neurological problem, asthma, I mean, it's easier to get that information from the, from the hospital, but they're still obligated to go get it and include that in this full and individual evaluation. We've had kids that have had uh, sickle cell uh, that has affected their educational performance when the weather changes and the school doesn't know anything about it. Now that's inappropriate because that's affecting the way that they learn. They can't sit upright in an extreme weather change. They need to know that when they're planning for this child's education so that they can put in some really easy, basic accommodations to make sure that the child's uh, you know, put in the best possible position to learn. So here you go with uh, the areas that are suspected of disability. I think I've hit them all. Social and emotional you know, behavior, that needs to be evaluated. Behavior is evaluated in a very uh, specific way, different from kind of the traditional psychoeducational evaluation that you may be uh, used to or may be, rec you may be recognized. Um, <clears throat> behavior is usually evaluated through what's called a functional behavioral analysis, an FBA. FBAs are the process by which a behavior specialist, hopefully, uh, will identify the target behaviors that the child is having, will take data on those behaviors um, so that we can, uh, as a team, hypothesize of what the function of that behavior is. Why is the child doing what they're doing? And then put in some interventions or, process, or hopefully some instruction to redirect that behavior to a behavior that doesn't affect learning. Um, so that the child can stay in school. Uh, in the negative behavioral context, it's more obvious, but it's any behavior. Tourette's is a tick. You know, if the child's screaming expletives in class, you know, that's a behavior that adversely affects learning. If it's uh, forgetfulness, you know, or let me give a better one. <clears throat> Anybody got a good one? Not a negative behavior? I can't think of a good one. We'll get that one after the break. Uh, but it's not just negative behaviors. It's all, oh, I got one. I had a case just, just last month. Child draws. Child had Asperger's, uh, really interesting, and would draw to the exclusion of do their work. That doesn't hurt anybody. That doesn't disrupt class. But he would just not sit down and take his quiz. He would draw. And he drew some fantastic drawings. He did anime. Uh, and, you know, it actually communicate his feelings through his drawings. But he's got to learn biology, too. And so we needed to take data on those drawings 
and that behavior so that we can put some instruction and intervention in. Um, doesn't get you, no, that doesn't get you sent to the principal's office, but surely adversely affects your learning. Do you guys see the distinction? Good. <clears throat> Procedurally, it must be full and individual initial, and the initial evaluation must be done within 60 days of consent or referral from the SST team. And, and we argue about that 60 days um, applying only to initial evaluations. And in fact, the letter of the regulation says it's only initial evaluations. Um, I make the argument there's no evaluation that should take more than 60 days anyway. And if there is a denial of FAPE uh, that's been you know, identified, the longer they, the school waits, the more denying of FAPE that's going on. So initial evaluation, there is a 60-day requirement for a reevaluation that does not exist. Um, they must obtain informed consent from the parent, and we'll talk about parent uh, after the break. Um, and the, they must first conduct a hit vision and hearing screen and use a variety of assessment tools and strategies, including information provided by the parent, maybe that court evaluation, uh, maybe some other information that is relevant to you know, the way the child learns. Um, and so that's the, the, the procedural components of evaluation. And here you go. The 60 days, by the way, it's really, uh, I think, a, a nice practice point to know that it's not just 60 days to evaluate and to make a report. It's 60 days to evaluate and then determine if the child, with a child is a child with a disability and what are the educational needs of that child, which means we got to come back to a meeting. It's 60 days to come back and determine eligibility. Um, and so, you know, when you're counting, when you're doing, writing your letter uh, to the school district that they're delaying, you know, if they haven't, if they've given you the report, but they haven't had the meeting to determine eligibility, they haven't complied with the statute. The substantive uh, requirements for evaluations are that LEAs, they must utilize assessment tools that do not discriminate, uh, are validated for the purpose that they're being used, and that cover all areas of suspected disability. And this, you know, essentially, what should an evaluation be? And we talked about it. The scope of it should be inclusive. It's multidisciplinary. It should go out into the far corners of this child's experience to, coll or to collect information to give a complete picture of a disabled child, uh, you know, strengths and weaknesses. <clears throat> All right, so we were just talking. When, if you have to have parental consent to go forward with the evaluation and you have reluctant, resistant, or obstructionist parents, do you believe as a mandated reporter the school system should, in fact, at least file um, or contact the Department of Family and Children's Services as to educational neglect concerns? Well, I know they'll screen it out, but I'm still just asking. <laughs> I mean, I'm just... Is the... the refusal to because give their consent. Because how do you effectively level? educate the child as an institution, as the school system, if you're having a parent that simply refuses to yeah. acknowledge the process? I'm not going to answer that one. That one, that one. that one's too hard and there's a video rolling. Uh, but I, honestly, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, There you go. That, yeah, I'm not getting into that one. I, the better question was, what if the parent is a foster parent or there is no parent and you're just a defects case worker at the table? Let me answer that one. Um, the answer for that one is that the definition of parent under IDEA is very broad. It includes um, not just biological parent, but foster parent or any other um, person that has been designated to be the parent, uh, if that is a, a good enough definition. And it also provides a surrogate provision whereby uh, a school, if there is no parent and they've attempted to uh, identify a parent, no, there is not one that can be identified, can move through the process of appointing a surrogate. Uh, you should be aware that the court can also, our court, Fulton, DeKalb, Metro Courts, can also uh, go through that process of appointing a surrogate and identify that surrogate and send them to the the special education procedures to uh, to advocate for or to sign that consent or advocate for a uh, um, uh, service. So uh, I know it's not a, uh, a complete answer, but it's as good as I can do. I'm going to give, if you guys want five minutes, I'll give it to you. I still have just this scintillating stuff, apparently, uh, that I can give you if you want to stay, uh, but five minutes if you want it. Everybody? 
consensus? No, we'll stay. Break. Break. Five minutes. But we're back, and I think we're live. And where we stop was evaluation, uh, second step in the process, and I was giving you the substantive requirements. Um, the reason that it's important to know what the school's requirements are for evaluation are when it comes time to agree or disagree with the evaluation um, and what that means for, for advocates and those that are um, trying to, uh, to gain as much information about a kid uh, so that they can plan. Um, as a rule of thumb, and I won't, we don't need to go into the legal underpinnings of it, but if you can't create an IEP with an evaluation, then most likely it's not appropriate. And the reason is, uh, I said we weren't going to, but we will. Uh, the reason is because it must, according to the regulations, be sufficiently comprehensive to identify all of the student's special education needs. And you have the site there. Um, so it's not enough just to do the evaluation. Uh, but you have to be able to identify all of the special education needs from the evaluation. Um, and really, that's uh, generally uh, speaking where, the, where school evaluations can fall down, is that they, they may do the basic assessments. Um, they may put the information in a report fashion and give you uh, a snapshot, um, but they don't connect the dots. And so without the dots being connected, we don't know what special education needs the child may have, and therefore the evaluation would be inappropriate. And we'll talk about why that's important uh, in a few slides. And I've given you, uh, and this kind of goes back to the discussion we have, uh, the paperwork can be thick. Kids have been subjected to lots of evaluations, uh, Part B developmental evaluations, um, Medicaid evaluations, court-ordered evaluations, home studies, psychiatric screenings. Um, they all provide information, but whether or not it meets uh, the school's requirements for what they have to do when they consider eligibility uh, is a different thing. And that's why, yeah, bring your court evaluations, bring your home studies to the extent they're relevant, bring the, uh, you know, the, the part B, the babies can't wait developmental needs uh, assessment checklists, bring that. Uh, but it has to meet the, the, the criteria. You have to have information sufficient to determine the criteria for eligibility. And we're going to go into eligibility, which is the third step in the process. Um, eligibility, and I told you this, and I want to reinforce it, it means the child is disabled and needs uh, special education. Um, eligibility, for the most part, and I actually confirmed this with, in a conversation in IEP last week, um, is statistical. It's about the way schools are counting their kids. It is not necessarily about service or, oh, it's not about service or placement. It's just about being able to count heads, group them so that we can determine who is where and how much funding we should give to each. Um, why that's important? Because if you are um, other health impaired, that doesn't mean that you have to get other health impaired service, because there is no such thing. Um, if you are, uh, intellectually disabled. It doesn't require an intellectually, an intellectually disabled classroom. And the most important one, just because you have or you don't have the label of autism doesn't mean you can't access the services that are provided to kids with autism. It means nothing. Eligibility does not dictate service or placement, even though we oftentimes get tracked into that conversation. Uh, the most obvious one I can give you is when a child meets the criteria for eligibility under emotionally behavioral disorder, especially for young kids, and we have a conversation about, in smaller counties especially, the EBD classroom, you know, it's a natural fit. Well, he's eligible for EBD. We should put him in the EBD placement. That's not the way the analysis works, and we'll talk about development of IEP and placement uh, in, in, in a minute. Uh, but the point is, eligibility does not dictate service or placement. Service is dictated on the needs of the child. Placement is dictated by the development of the, the uh, services in an IEP, and where can that be done in the least restrictive environment. That's the way the analysis works. There are 13 categories of eligibility. Uh, a DSM-4 or medical diagnosis is only half of the equation, and be aware. IDEA and SSI and all other types of, of uh, benefits that are existing out there in, the, in the, uh, the ether, they all have different standards. And that goes both ways. I got kids that are IDEA eligible that can't get SSDI. 
I got kids in SSDI that don't confer eligibility for IDEA. It's because they speak different languages. And I can come in and try to interpret and try to overlay one on the other and, and advocate for uh, an eligibility. But it's not going to be enough for us to say, hey, he's SSDI eligible. Give us eligibility under IDEA. That's just not the way it works. Um, we got to go through the 13 doors to the house that is special education. I always give a visual. SST, the pyramid of interventions, that's the doorway. That's, that's the sidewalk up to the doorway. The doorway is eligibility. There's 13 of them. Once you're in the house, you have the protections of the special education laws, if that helps you. But there's 13 doors. You got to walk through one of them. <clears throat> now, I told you it was important to have the school evaluate, and I told you what the requirements of an evaluation are. And now I'm going to tell you one of the advocacy points that is no secret. And the minute you raise it at a school meeting, you will see eyebrows from the school people come up and they'll know what you're talking about. But any time a parent disagrees with an evaluation conducted by the school, they have the right to secure an independent educational evaluation at the school's expense. This is probably the strongest right that parents have under IDEA. Uh, the Supreme Court recently even pointed specifically to the IEE as a right that levels the field between schools with resources and experts that are in-house and parents that oftentimes do not have resources to secure experts. Um, that, that's uh, simply, uh, simply put the reason that it's in there. It's to level the field. An independent educational evaluation is just what it says. It's independent and it's an evaluation for educational purposes. Um, the school can place no conditions on the evaluation other than your evaluator must meet the criteria that schools use to, for their own evaluators. That's the only condition. And even though that's as clear as it could be in the regulations, I still just looked at a big school district's letter to a parent that had a litany of conditions. It still happens out there. Be aware, there are no conditions that can be placed on the IEE. Okay? Once you ask for it, you've disagreed with the school evaluation, the school has the option of either A, agreeing and funding the evaluation, or B, taking the parent to due process to defend the evaluation that they've completed. Practically speaking, it is cheaper to pay for an independent evaluation than it is to sue somebody to defend your own. And so the IE does become a very real and strong advocacy a tool um, gives us an expert that can give an outside view of what's going on with this kid and we can bring that back to the IEP table or an eligibility table um, to to advocate for what it is we think the child needs <clears throat> I gave you the site there oh, I didn't even know that was on there evaluate the student they get paid by the school they level the field and I think that we've gotten all that um, for us in the field, uh, it's really important if we are going to start using IEEs, and I, I put this out there for lawyers uh, especially because we have this reputation for uh, going out very vigorously to hire experts and then somehow leaving the experts in a lurch. Um, I build relationships with all of the experts and I, I, I work very hard to make sure that they are plugged into the process. I want them to come to IEP meetings. I, I shepherd through their invoices to make sure that the school knows that they're supposed to get paid by the school. Um, and then I, I try to make sure that their experience is a positive one. And I only give that discussion to the room so that we have more independent experts that are willing to come into IEP uh, type situations. Um, because they're just, they're not a whole lot. Um, and, you know, the number of good, strong child psychologists that do, you know, education work uh, isn't that many, especially when you get out in the rural areas. And we can develop more by bringing them into this process and showing them that, that it's not always scorched earth litigation. You know, give us a good evaluation. I've had situations where I present an IE to a school and they say, yeah, that is right. We will do that. And then let's just move on. And I think that's a, that's a type of situation where... I've built bridges in both directions. I've got another psychologist that's willing to work with schools. I've got schools willing to work with that psychologist. And, you know, they're all willing to work with me, which is good. Um, we've gone through that. And 
<clears throat> we've walked through one of the 13 doors of eligibility into the House of Special Education, and that leads us to the fourth step in the process, which is placement. Placement, in my mind, is both the development of an IEP and its implementation. And so this carries us through to the, when does the kid actually get the services that we talked about? Um, IEP are developed, and that's an individualized educational plan developed by an IEP team. Um, the IEP is developed by a team of teachers, parents, and professionals with information. It's based on current and appropriate information about the student, and it includes meaningful parent participation. Uh, the team is responsible for monitoring progress and reconvening as needed. And that last bullet is there for a reason, because I've been told several times out in the field that we're only allowed one IEP meeting a year. That's not true. Not true. Uh, we could have another whole discussion on misinformation in special education, but it's not true. You can have an IEP meeting as appropriate. Anytime that a child is not making progress, anytime, you should have an IEP meeting, because you should be trying to identify why the child's not making progress and changing what it is that we're doing. Um, it is just insufficient to say, well, 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 we'll watch it, or it's insufficient to say, well, we're going to meet in May when it's you know, October. Um, that is not what IET, I, uh, excuse me, IDEA contemplates. They contemplate an ongoing process of monitoring, of reconvening, of revising, and of monitoring again. Now, if that's happening, the schools are protecting themselves from liability because they're doing everything in their power. They have not created a factual situation where they're oblivious or intentionally disregarding what's going on with the child. They're actively engaging in the collaborative process. But in fact, situations where you see a parent asking for an IEP and, not one, and one's not given, or you see nobody doing anything and the child's you know, academic progress or educational progress is falling off um, into you know, the void, that's the type of situation where you know we have some liability problems. So <clears throat> it's supposed to be reconvened as needed, and as needed means when there's something going on. I mean, when we see that there's you know things aren't going in the direction that we wanted. I saw so many hands go up. Did you guys know that there were this many components to an IEP? I mean, it seems that way when you sit there for seven hours, but there are. There's lots of pieces to this puzzle, to this plan. Um, and it starts and it, it really all hinges on, and this is something in IEP advocacy that um, I, I try to take a, a good a bit of time to explain, is that it hinges on present levels of performance. Because that's the statement of strengths and weaknesses. We get in the meeting, present levels of performance are right there on the page, school reads them and we move right on to special considerations. That's not sufficient if it hasn't covered all of the strengths and weaknesses as we know them to be, as the evaluators identified them, as our expert has explained them to us, you have to take your time in present levels of performance so that you get the IEP right. You have to go through and identify all the ways that this particular IQ score and these achievement scores manifest in the classroom. It's not enough to just list those scores. That information doesn't just come from the school even though the school will have a proposed, hear me, proposed, proposed present levels of performance. That is not the final present levels of performance, and the school is inviting us to provide our information to them at that point. If we don't do that, then we will be left with what's on the paper, and that may or may not cover all of the child's strengths and weaknesses, and if that happens, we may or may not get all the services and instruction in the IEP that are required. Does that make sense? So I could list this IEP's components and, and we could go through them uh, that way, but I, it's more important for you to understand the way in which an IEP is created. And it's created by identifying the strengths and educational weaknesses of a child as a result of the disability, and then addressing those through service and instruction, and then putting that into placement. So you do have present levels of performance. Then you go through special consent. Yeah. I don't know that you would have covered this necessarily, but I have a, a child who's had an IEP for many years. And she's getting ready for her last year of high school. And they're talking about doing 
about reevaluating or, or doing whatever is necessary for her to have something in place to go to college. And what is that? What is that going to get her? Because I don't think I understand how that works. Okay. And the question was about transitioning out of secondary into post-secondary life, which could include college. I'm going to assume that they're talking about doing some sort of transition of assessments or evaluations. It could be a vocational assessment or some other type of educational testing to determine whether or not the child's going to require accommodations when they go to college. Um, you transition out of IDEA, and so the, our talk is going to be pretty short, uh, but you are still covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act in Section 504. So if you are a disabled person uh, with a qualifying disability uh, that substantially limits, like, substantially limits a major life activity like learning, then you would, would receive an accommodation for whatever disability you have. So I'm guessing they are moving with a transition plan, and that's transition to post-secondary life, and then possibly building a record for whatever needed accommodations they would have uh, when they And do colleges college. pay attention to that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so I'm losing time, and I want to move through to some of the things that, uh, that are unique to uh, kids and child welfare. Uh, the IEP progression, I've kind of talked about it. Uh, remember, uh, your client has the right to know the basis for any school decision. And so as we go through and they say, well, we're not going to include that particular piece of information. Um, you have the right to know why a school won't do that. You have the right to know why, and that's the a parent has, excuse me, the right to know why, and that has to be in writing. It has to be, a, a, um, has to be based on scientific and research-based methodologies. Uh, and harder to think about when it comes to, you know, the example that I gave, easier to think about should you propose a certain reading program, a school proposes a different reading program, and you disagree, you have the re right to know why that reading program that the school has proposed is appropriate for the child or is appropriate for, to be included in the IEP. Um, that right comes through what's called prior written notice. All right. Prior written notice is another strong procedural right that the family has to understand the basis for a school decision to either uh, move a particular way or to reject a proposal by a parent. So it's both of those. <clears throat> I'm deciding whether or not we should go into this because you all are such great advocates anyway. Um, yeah, this is where I wanted to head. Special issues for court-involved youth, and we're going to use the remainder of our time to talk about this. In your materials, I put in uh, information on discipline, and I also put in information on disputes, which is what do you do when the, par the parties disagree? Um, if we don't get to those and you have questions about those, uh, I'm happy to field them, uh, or you could invite us back. And, uh, I can give you the special ed, too. Uh, <laughs> so who is the parent? Transferring uh, the foster care student and understanding discipline. IDEA defines parent as the birth or adoptive parent or another qualified person which can include a foster parent, IDEA guardian, a person acting in the place of parent with whom the child lives, the person legally responsible, or the surrogate. Okay, do you see how broadly parent is defined? There is no excuse for no parent to be attending an IEP meeting or for more accurately stated, for the school to say there's no parent available to advocate for the student or to receive notice of these meetings. Um, it's simply, it, it doesn't jive with what IDEA contemplates for advocacy on the family side. I'm, I'm going to keep going and we can talk. Is that okay? Well, is there a hierarchy? Yes. If okay. the biological parent is available, um, the biological parent, I believe IDEA contemplates that the biological parent uh, is the parent that will receive notice. Quickly stated. Okay. Nope, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. Good question. This actually, uh, I researched this. There is no authority for IDEA guardian except that various uh, states and juvenile courts and uh, stakeholders have developed this IDEA guardian concept. Uh, I would say our Fulton County um, <clears throat> educational advocate is an IDEA guardian. The gentleman in the second row right there with the bow tie He's an IDEA guardian. Um, the court has developed this person to advocate for the needs of the court-involved youth. And I think that in, in, in that situation, if there is no parent that is available, the school will recognize the IDEA guardian. Now, that doesn't mean, yeah. 
I don't think that that would, uh, I, I think that conflicts with a few other regulatory, uh, some regulatory language, but um, I would have to look that up, okay? Um, and let's move on. <laughs> so I told you about surrogate. Um, surrogates, when there are no parent, when there is no, quote, parent as IDEA is identified uh, to ensure the rights of a child are protected, there's no parent be identified. The public agency has not been able to locate the parent. The child is awarded of the state under the laws of that state or the child is unaccompanied uh, homeless youth. Um, you should be aware. You would think, wow, ward of the state. I mean, we, this covers every kid. Um, but you guys know how Georgia defines ward of the state and how our, regu our state board rules um, exclude any kid that's in the custody uh, of department. So they are not a ward of the state, actually, for IDEA purposes. Um, and so there is no surrogate appointed, even though the child's in defects custody. Um, so they don't come underneath that, that provision in this regulation. And in fact, I don't see a lot of surrogates in the field. I just, it's simply not a step that gets taken. Uh, we usually are able to identify a party to come forward uh, and, and be the, quote, IDEA parent for the child. <clears throat> Um, the second issue that we deal with with kids in care uh, that is a challenge for IDEA is the way in which kids move. And we had some questions about this uh, earlier. Um, Fostering Connections Act, and you have the site there, and you guys might know more about it than I do. Uh, but I know about the school components. And the Fostering Connections Act was passed, and it had some significant language about the way in which kids and child welfare's educational needs would be addressed. Um, it was enacted in 2008, and we just got... Uh, state regulations, I believe, implementing uh, either statute or rules, and I'm not clear which, um, that require, and this is uh, federally, that a case plan contain assurances that the placement of each child in foster care take into account the appropriateness of the educational setting. Uh, they require case coordination between child welfare and the LEA, and they require that the child remain in the school in which the child is enrolled at the time of placement unless that's not in the best interest. Statutory, thank you. Um, and, and do you have a site for our Georgia code? 151155 in the Georgia code. So Fostering Connections is implemented by Georgia in, in, in the state statute. Um, these are, are very interesting concepts that actually we could get the LEA and the, and, the, and the Child Welfare Agency to sit down and contemplate school placement. Um, Melissa, uh, I've sat and watched her talk as well, and one of the things that we both have identified and that we both hope to work on is that there is no provision, nor is there any money for the transportation that we required for a child that's moved into a new placement to attend the old school. No money. Yeah, they just don't pay for it, and so we don't often see, unless it's a very close, um, this, this provision be implemented um, if it's district to district or school to school. It's very difficult to get transportation in place and therefore we don't get to access this educational stability component of the Fostering Connections Act like we would want to. I mean, for my money, if you've got a, a, a stable educational placement and possibly an unstable home placement, I would want to keep that piece. And so we can go to the school and ask for that administrative placement and ask for that transportation to be provided if it works. You know, if you're in Metro and there's bus lines and that's something that can work, yeah, can work then you make it work. But I would say that on a system level, that is not provided. And that's, that's my understanding. We could talk about that too. Um, I've gotten mixed messages from the state and for some of the cases that I've been in and whether or not um, once you've gotten even to a group home, whether or not you can be covered under McKinney-Vento. And it's one of those things where I find that we, we, f we have less legal justification and more of this kind of, let's just try to do something right. And so when times get tight, you're really going to need the first and not the second. <laughs> um, but yes, I think that's probably a, a good point of advocacy is McKinney-Vento uh, does cover uh, kids that are in temporary situations in child welfare. Um, it's just the way the state has defined what's temporary. Um, <clears throat> and I knew that uh, there was a, I did not know the, the, the statute, statutory site for fostering connections, but the Georgia Department of Education did pass a state board rule 
on these points. Um, and it did put in some specific requirements for kids that are transferring. And I give you the site there, and it's on the same page as the special ed uh, rules. Um, when a child's home placement affects their school placement, uh, the rule requires that the department notify the receiving school, the department now, that's DFACS, notify the receiving school district of the student within five days of the actual transfer. So you're moving the kid, you have to tell the receiving school about the transfer. And then within 10 days of getting that notice, the receiving school must request the student records. At the same time, there is a requirement under the state board rule that the department will furnish medical and educational records in the possession of the department, um, except if you have to get consent of the parents, so something that would be uh, exclusively confidential. And then within five days of getting those records, uh, the receiving school district shall schedule an educational planning meeting with the department. So it could be an IEP meeting, could be an SST meeting, could just be a staffing, where they will bring everybody together, um, have a meeting, uh, and then discuss you know, school placement, discuss educational needs, if there's any um, you know, regular education interventions that have to be implemented, or the IEP and how the IEP is going to be implemented. Uh, in that situation that you were envisioning, uh, where persons transferring district to district, it was basis of a, if it was the basis of a child welfare placement, this would have applied. So, so when did this come effect? This was in effect in 2000, anybody, nine? I can't remember. So 2008 was the state law, or the federal law. I imagine it was probably 2009. Do all school districts follow this? Boom. <laughs> Do they follow? Ah, I'm not answering that question. Um, I, I, this is the first time I ever saw this. Yep. Yeah. It's on, it's. There's different things in their, in their school district. Nope. State board rule. They have to. If they're not, they're not in compliance, and I would report that to the Department of Education so they can investigate and make a change. Um, you know, it's new. It's relatively new. And the timelines are very short. Uh, but they have to be short because we're talking about real time, you know, real time rulemaking. Once you put a rule in, it, it, it impacts the, the educational you know, status of the kid that day. Um, so it has to be short. Um, the last bullet there the school must appoint a surrogate for a student with a disability in this situation. Um, it, it, that's what it says in the rule. Uh, you know, whether or not that happens is another question, too. Um, and the way that jives with the surrogate rule is, is a legal issue and one that we probably shouldn't uh, raise right now. That's uh, a, a transfer problem. I apologize. Um, what can the court do? And if you can look through this, I, I don't know if your materials are better. But, and, and as advocates or people that appear in front of judges, what can we do to, to bring the court into this process and, and give, I think, a little bit of, of gravity to what this rule says? We can ask the court to establish an order of the critical dates. And I've actually drafted uh, proposed orders um, and provided them to juvenile court judges around the state so they could use these, um, where we just plug in the critical dates and make it part of a court order. Um, they could order an officer to monitor the school transfer issue um, and advocate for strict compliance. Certainly, um, we could have either a guardian ad litem, a CASA, one of the, uh, the case workers, or a child advocate be appointed and designated with the responsibility to go follow up and make sure this happens. And I think that's the disconnect. It's we make the rule, we tell the court the school's going to do this, but we don't give the court any tools to make sure it happens. And this is the, the tool that we could use, is that we will designate a person in the courtroom that day when we see that there's going to be a change in placement to say, you're the person that's going to be responsible for that piece of it. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not answering that one, <laughs> but uh, it would depend on uh, kind of, there's a few limitations on who can be a surrogate in the surrogate rule. That's the best answer I can give. Um, the, the last bullet that I think has fallen off the page there is order an educational placement review hearing uh, to go through these critical dates and to hear from that officer that's been designated so that um, we can get an update. And then if it's not happening, we just subpoenaed the school people to come in and just tell us why. And that's a matter of practice you know, in other proceedings, in school discipline proceedings, we bring school people in. Um, to bring them in for, for a child welfare case is not uncommon. Uh, it, it's just that we would have them understand that there are critical dates that have to be followed pursuant to state board rule um, that, that we would like to, uh, <clears throat> oh, three minutes to do school discipline, um, like to see done. Uh, I'm coming up on three minutes. I'm not going to go into school discipline or dispute. I'm going to leave that for you today. 
Uh, but I will use the last bit of time we have or any time that you guys want to stay to answer some questions. Does anybody uh, have questions? We'll pass around a microphone. Can you go back to that previous slide. I wanted to copy that last That's an easy one. <laughs> it's, and it's also in your materials. So I'm not positive. Yes, we're, and I believe Emory's going to post this on the, on the website along with the, uh, the archive webcast. So you'll have this electronically. Yeah. Um, what, what court are you talking about? Is that juvenile, juvenile court? court? I think the juvenile court. And there's no, uh, no statutory mandate that I'm relying on. But when Fostering Connections was passed and when we saw that you know, this was going to be uh, you know, a very strong tool to coordinate between child welfare and juvenile court, um, these are some of the ideas that I proposed um, to the juvenile court judges as ways in which we could plug them in um, to this process to make sure that it actually happens so that we don't have the situation that we heard about earlier. Any other questions about special education or uh, things that we've covered today? Well, this question is in regards to when we have young people who are in foster care, especially our teenagers, um, and they are at the age of 16, you realize that they are definitely behind in their classes and all. You also realize that they're, uh, based upon their information that you're receiving from school, that they've had some challenges in the areas of reading and math, along with the other things that goes along with some of the things you've already outlined it, um, to meet the criteria of being a special ed. But sometimes the school will delay allowing those young people to participate in the IEP process because they're 16 going on 17. How do we make sure that our 17-year-olds who are still in a high school setting, who are meeting some of the other criteria, are being addressed and those IEP, IEPs are taken care of? Okay. Uh, and the question is, with high school age kids, there's a delay oftentimes, even though the, 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 the need is obvious. And how do we overcome that delay before it gets to be too late? And I think that the, the law contemplates this. And it says that um, you can move through the pyramid of interventions as slow or as fast as required. Um, I think it takes advocacy and reaching out to the appropriate people school level. And then if that doesn't work, at the central office level. I would say you know, you, you've got to find the special education teacher and coordinator for that school and notify them in writing that you have a child that's suspected of being disabled and that is in need of special education and that you request an evaluation. Um, that's the first step. Until you request an evaluation and get the school moving on that, um, you're going to continue through this, you know, almost this bog uh, of procedural bog where you get bogged down and, you know, all kinds of delay and, you know, email missing and <coughs> phone calls and voicemails. You know, put it in writing, send it to the special ed teacher and coordinator. If you don't get a response, send it to that person's supervisor, which at the school level is principal and then special education area coordinator. Um, I usually find that information out through the Board of Education website. Uh, I look for contact information. I contact them directly. Um, and I, I usually, when I'm talking to advocates and people that are in the field, I urge them to reach out first. Um, get there and then reach out second and do it again. Um, you're doing two things. One, you're building a record. You're building a record and there's no public agency that will not respond to a paper record. They understand that. Um, two, you will get things moving. You will create a sense of urgency among people. And you know, those kids are in the classroom. And if they're in the classroom and they're not succeeding, that's a concern for regular ed administrators who want those kids to pass tests and for special education teachers who, I mean, I represent teachers and students. There's some very committed, passionate special education teachers in our state who all they really, really want is for these kids to do great. I mean, it's really true. Uh, so you know, you're gonna start pushing the buttons and get things moving. You had a question? Um, just from a practical standpoint, when um, I'm a school administrator, and when when a child enrolls at the school, I know this sounds very basic, but many times the case manager, the parent, the foster parent will bring nothing with them and will just say, oh, he was in um, special ed. We cannot put a child in, spe in a special ed class without the documentation that comes with it. And so if we have to request records, a local school also if we're requesting that from another school that school cannot fax us an IEP you're not supposed to fax IEPs so then you're talking three to five days to get so just as a foster parent who has gotten kids in special ed and as an administrator the case manager needs to have everything 
it needs to travel with you and you need to have a copy of the most updated IEP most the cycle any any testing that's been done because to, in order for the school to get it it does take five to ten days so no matter if you contacted this the the department or whatever the department is I'm not sure if that's the department of ed defects a school but um, we have to do what's practical we cannot just put a child in special ed when the parent says my child was in special ed in Daughtry County I mean we can't do that that's that's not protecting their rights. Um, and we also get many parents who um, try to hide the fact that their child was in special ed too. So that's a whole other issue. But um, so just know it's not a lot of times that schools are trying to balk against serving a child. It's just we can't do it based on verbal, my child was in special ed. Yeah. So and the I, more I paperwork you can bring to a school, a receiving school, um, will be helpful. Yeah, I think that's good, good advice in, in any situation, child welfare, mental health or otherwise. You know, we got clients that carry, you know, boxes <laughs> of documents with their kids uh, or to any meeting that they go to. Uh, you know, if you're advocating for a kid, you know, you, you, at some point you got those documents, bring them with you. I mean, even if they never asked for them and they already had them, it doesn't matter. You've covered that base. Any other questions? Yeah. I have a question about the discipline. Okay. School discipline. And we didn't go over school discipline, but I'll definitely field a question okay. if you guys want to hear uh, the we answer. We have a young person served by an IEP and as you know there's only a 10-day interruption on an IEP of their education. This young person got suspended. This young person got suspended from school and was sent to an alternative school and then was, sus was suspended from alternative school and sent to night school. Aren't there resources supposed to follow them if they're like in a um, psychoed center? Yeah, and, and I think your question is, what are the requirements on a school when they've taken a disciplinary action against a kid? And, and we've got an overlap there because I think I heard you say psycho ed, which is a little different. Uh, but let's start with, and here's, okay, but then we'll go right to psycho ed. A psycho educational center is an, actually an educational placement, and it's a placement for only disabled kids. And so they will be implementing all of the services in an IEP because they have the, the people that are trained and certified to provide that instruction. Uh, that's not my concern. Uh, I would have concerns about the appropriateness of an IEP and the appropriateness of taking disciplinary action for a behavior that may be a manifestation of a disability. But if they've moved the child to a psychoed center, that's not done through a disciplinary action of a regular ed tribunal. That's done through the IEP team generally. Um, going through, and just real quick, because I know we've run past our time, um, it is a 10-day rule. Anytime that you've removed a child from school for greater than 10 days, and that's either 10 days consecutively or cumulatively over a school year, um, then you're required to go through the procedures uh, in, in the code for determining whether or not the behavior was a manifestation of the child's disability. Um, if it is a manifestation of the disability, then we go through, and I'm not going to give you all specifics because we're over, um, then we go through uh, an analysis of whether or not the, the IEP is appropriate um, and what modifications need to be made um, because obviously something's not going right if we have behaviors that are leading to dis charges of school discipline, uh, sorry, charges of violations of the code of conduct. Um, if it's not a manifestation, then they can take the same disciplinary actions that they would against non-disabled kids. But here is the key. Uh, oh, I don't get the little thing. At all times, the services uh, in the IEP must be provided. FAPE always has to be provided, uh, no matter the disciplinary action that, the, that the, the school takes. That's why you can't just expel. Now, you can remove them from a school if you're going to provide all the services that are listed in the IEP. You know, if they had two hours of speech, three hours of OT, and 16 goals and objectives, well, you've got to have a special education teacher out there to implement the goals and objectives and take data. You know, so schools don't, don't expel kids with disabilities. They move them to a place where they can still implement the IEP, and that's the requirement of IDEA. Let me leave with uh, a pep talk, maybe. You guys are in one of the most challenging fields. You are uh, working with one of the most challenging areas of law, of policy, of public interest that you could, and I encourage you to stay in it. The more you do it, the more face time you get at schools, the more the schools will come to understand that we know what we're talking about, and we're just trying to move these processes forward. Um, 
It's not easy, and oftentimes it can be, uh, let's say, exhausting, uh, but it's critical. It's critical to home placements. It's critical to overall best interest of the child. And you know, ultimately, we're trying to improve outcomes for kids, and that's what you guys are doing when you plug the education piece into, court for, uh, into the, uh, the status of court-involved use. So thanks so much for coming out, and I really appreciate your time.